Hi everyone and welcome to the next video of a game from Bobby Fischer's My 60 Memorable Games. This time we're going to have a look at a great game he played against a phenomenal Hungarian Grandmaster, Lejos Portis, at a tournament in Santa Monica in 1966. Portis had the white pieces and opened with d4, to which Fischer answered, as usual, with knight f6, the dynamic choice, instead of playing symmetrically with a d5 and the main idea at this stage is to prevent white from playing an immediate e4 and establishing a strong pawn center. Portis continued with c4 and here instead of going into his standard king's indian with g6 Fischer surprised his opponent with e6 adding in his notes that he was aiming to throw Portis off balance as he knew that he was an expert in the king's indian lines. So now there are several openings the game could transpose into, and after knight c3 and bishop b4 we have a Nimzo Indian defense, which Fisher used on occasion. It remains one of the most highly respected defenses to a queen's pawn opening today, and black will voluntarily give up his bishop pair with bishop takes c3 and double uh, white's pawns in returns in uh, most variations. and. Black will aim to keep the position relatively closed for his knights, and white will aim to open it for his bishops. It leads to a lot of imbalance, which is crucial for an active game. Portish continued with e3, which I believe is the Rubenstein variation, and a solid continuation. It was a fashionable variation at the time, and remains popular today. Playing instead bishop g5, Fischer felt led to little advantage after h6, bishop h4, c5, d5, d6, challenging, uh, sorry, not supporting c5, e3, bishop takes c3, check, b takes c3, and e5, where the knights are definitely going to be stronger than the bishops in this closed position. So e3, anyway, is the game continuation, and now came b6 from Fischer, aiming to develop the light squared bishop along the c8, the a6 diagonal of course. And Portis continued with knight g e2, and at this point Fischer gave a small bit of analysis on another line which was played against him by Ryshevsky at the US Championship earlier in the year. It went bishop d3, and now bishop b7, which is taking control of the e4 square, which is one of the ideas of the Nimzo Indian, as well as creating the immediate threat of uh, bishop takes g2. Um, so knight f3, and now castles, although Fischer added that sharper was knight e4, where after castling and f5, if instead uh, knight takes c3, b takes c3, bishop takes c3, rook b1, and knight c6, um, you know, white doesn't have enough for his pawn here, so that's also a good continuation. But the line that was played in the game was f5, and now bishop takes c4, f takes c4, knight d2, attacking the e4 pawn. So bishop takes c3, b takes c3, castles, and now queen g4, attacking the e4 pawn once more. And if you want to try and spot the correct way to defend it, then uh, stop the video now. Rook f5 is the move, and it equalizes for black, as there's no knight takes e4 because of h5, deflecting the queen from the defense of the knight. Um, so, castles is uh, what was played against Ryshevsky, and uh, Ryshevsky also castled, and then in that game Fischer played bishop takes c3. Also playable is d5 here. But bishop takes c3, b takes c3, now bishop e4, and if queen c2, bishop takes f3, leads to a very interesting and dynamic battle after g takes f3, and c5 with two knights against two bishops and a shaky white pawn structure to attack throughout the game. But anyway, back to the game against Portish, 
which was knight g e2. And Fisher continued with bishop a6, which is an active idea that Fisher credits to David Bronstein. The thinking behind it will become clear a bit later. And Fisher had used this system with success in the 1966 US Championships. And uh, I think it's still known as the Fisher Variation in uh, some opening databases. And he noted too that a very interesting alternative is knight e4 with the continuation queen c2 and bishop b7 where one grandmaster game between Taimanov and Levin continued with f3 kicking the knight although probably better is uh, a3 so anyway that game went f3 and now knight takes c3 and knight takes c3 if instead b takes c3 and bishop d6 retains the bishop pair and gives black active play against the doubled c pawns for example e4 and knight c6 and black's at least equal if not better so uh, knight takes c3 is best and now queen h4 check and best play goes queen f2 bishop takes c3 check b takes c3 queen takes f2 check king takes f2 bishop a6 threatening knight c6 to a5 to attack this uh, c4 pawn gives at least equality to black if not more so back to the game continuation anyway Fisher has just played bishop a6 and uh, Portish continued with knight g3 which is a move that Fisher felt was somewhat inconsistent as the idea behind playing knight g e2 is to follow up with a3 in order to win the bishop pair and be able to recapture with a knight on c3 so without making the concession of the doubled c pawns uh, we can have a look at that quickly a3 and uh, bishop takes c3 check if instead bishop e7 knight f4 and d5 is what black will play here. Another of the ideas behind bishop a6 is to deny white kingside castling rights with this pawn push because um, the bishops are eyeing each other here and best play continues c takes d5, bishop takes f1, king takes f1 e takes d5 and now white has g4 threatening g5 and giving a slight edge as demonstrated in the 1954 but for Nick Smith's love world championship. So after a3, bishop takes c3 is best. And now knight takes c3 and d5 can again be played. So b3 and now castles. Uh, a4, knight c6 and white retains the bishop pair as I said without making the concession of doubled pawns. And Fisher reached this position with the black pieces twice in the 1966 US championships. One of his opponents was Addison, who played here, bishop b2, and Fisher achieved good play after d takes c4, b takes c4, now knight a5, threatening to take on c4, so knight b5, and now c6, kicking the knight, so knight a3, defending the c pawn, and now came queen e7 threatening queen b4 check winning the bishop b on b2 so queen c2 now c5 bishop e2 c takes d4 e takes d4 rook f c8 castles rook c6 bishop f3 apparently winning a rook but knight d5 is playable because it's exploiting the pin on the c pawn with the rook eyeing the queen and now there is no way for white to defend his c pawn effectively and black has a good edge here with the winning of this pawn coming up and no compensation for white it's simple chess create a weakness and attack it it's very direct and straightforward and it's the kind of play that fisher was superb at his other opponent who played this opening with white against him at the u.s championships that year was evans and uh, that game went as follows um, instead of bishop d2 
which is what um, the other guy played. We saw bishop e2 here, and uh, this was a better try. And play continued. D takes c4, and bishop a3, attacking the rook on f8. So rook e8, now b4, knight e7, and castling, which was a mistake. Better was uh, b5, bishop b7, now castling, and white can re retain the pawn and keep a small edge overall in the position. So castles, now knight e d5, rook c1, just defending the knight, c6, bishop f3, now b5, a5, and queen c7, where black retained a lasting advantage and won a nice game that I've already covered on uh, YouTube. You can check it out uh, if you search for it there. Um, so, to go back to the game continuation, anyway, um, Portish has just played knight g3, and Fischer continued with bishop takes c3 check, which is easily the best move here, despite not provoking the weakening move a3 first. Um, d5, instead hoping to trade light squared bishops, loses would have lost a piece to a queen a4 check at this stage. Um, d5, queen a4 check. So, uh, uh, that was the, the correct move by Fischer. And also inferior was uh, castling here for black. After, uh, oh sorry, instead of bishop takes c3, if he uh, castles instead, because now e4, as this, uh, the knight on g3 is supporting this strong central push, and black has not gained the e4 control as he hopes to in this opening, and white gets some initiative here after knight c6. Um, if instead c5, which is kind of like the routine move to play here, then comes d5, d6, bishop e2, e takes d5, e takes d5, bishop takes c3, b takes c3, knight bd7, castles, rook e8, and queen a4. And, uh, you know, white's uh, getting good initiative from this position. So, um, e4 would be correct. And uh, now, sorry, after uh, knight c6, bishop d3, um, apparently giving up the uh, d4 pawn is uh, a nice little trap. Um, if a knight takes d4, then queen a4 is going to fork to two bishops. So best play will continue d5. Um, and now c takes d5, bishop takes d3, queen takes d3, e takes d5, e4, and knight e4, where it's unwise to take the uh, e4 knight because it exposes the weak d4 pawn to attack. Much better is simply a3 and white has a clear advantage as demonstrated in Portish versus Spassky played in Moscow in 1967. Okay, so we'll go back to the game continuation anyway, which was bishop takes c3. So now of course b takes c3 and d5 threatening to win this pawn on c4 and also to exchange off the light squared bishops which is going to relieve white the bishop pair he's just gained and also deny castling rights as uh, previously indicated so it's very nice play from Fisher as it appears already at this early stage that he's taking control of the game and forcing hard decisions from his opponent. Portish continued with Queen F3 taking aim at the A8 rook in the event of D takes C4 and Fisher considered this whole idea dubious and pointed out that no better was bishop a3 despite taking control of a great diagonal for the dark square bishop and trapping the black king in the center at least temporarily because here black has d takes c4 where after queen f3 black can play queen d5 and if e4 queen c6 and there's not enough compensation for the pawn. Correct thought Fisher instead of queen f3 was um, c takes d5 and you know it leads to a level game and he noted you know that Portish's problems are stemming from his insistence on seeking the initiative where it is not correct to do so. After bishop takes f1, rook takes f1, 
why it retains the same slightest of edges as at the moment the game begins. So queen f3 and now fisher castles ensuring there's going to be no issues with bishop a3 and Fortish now elected to gambit a pawn with e4 which is an interesting continuation but perhaps more correct was c takes d5 where best play goes e takes d5 and not bishop takes f1 because thanks to the queen on f3 here white can play d takes e6 discovering an attack on the a8 rook and gaining an almost winning advantage after bishop takes g2 may as well play it so queen takes g2 and now queen d5 queen takes d5 knight takes d5 bishop a3 attacking the rook so rook e8 now c4 and you know white has the initiative as well as a pawn a far better center and uh, better development as well so it's clearly better so e takes d5 is a correct move now bishop takes a6 knight takes a6 queen e2 attacking the knight so queen c8 and now castles c5 d takes c5 knight takes c5 and c4 leading to um, a fairly equal game so e4 anyway is what uh, Portish played and Fisher declined the gambit with d takes e4 which he felt was the correct way to play the position against Anthony Sadie in the 1966 US Championships he had accepted with uh, d takes c4 and play continued bishop g5 and uh, not e5 hoping to win a piece with uh, two pieces attacked here because there's knight d5 simply to defend against it so uh, bishop g5 now that genuinely threatens e5 so h6 and uh, said he played bishop d2 but far better was h4 which prevents um, h takes g5 or white gets great play on the a files almost certainly a mating attack um, so you know correct is bishop b7 it's preventing this uh, e5 uh, push um, but now comes bishop takes f6 queen takes f6 queen takes f6 g takes f6 and bishop takes c4 white gets back the gambit pawn and retains a slight edge having damaged the black pawn structure um, so it's not really wise to accept the gambit the fisher didn't in this game instead playing d takes e4 so now came uh, some exchanges with knight takes e4 knight takes e4 and queen takes e4 attacking as before the a8 rook if you want to try and spot what fisher played here then stop the video now queen d7 is what it was an incredible move simply giving up his rook for reasons that will become apparent in a moment it's a far better move than the more routine knight d7 where white is doing well after bishop d3 threatening mate on h7 so knight f6 now queen h4 with a powerful bishop pair and very easy development this double c pawn is uh, you know a fairly inconsequential element of the position and white will enjoy a lasting edge from this position so queen d7 simply offering the rook and Portish declined it and instead played bishop a3 um, attacking Fisher's other rook which was a wise decision if instead queen takes a8 now knight c6 traps the queen um, and although white has two rooks for it after queen takes f8 check king takes f8 black is definitely better here and one of the ideas of playing knight c6 instead of this knight d7 maneuver is so that knight a6 can be played in order to attack this weakness which was created in the opening um, and black was also better if instead of uh, bishop a3 bishop d3 now f5 to uh, defend against the mate queen e2 now knight c6 with knight a5 coming as indicated and fisher's move 
queen d7 also defends the weak e6 pawn which allows this uh, f f5 push to be played um, after bishop d3 with the mate threat which is very useful as in these variations the knight is not available to come to f6 in order to defend h7 via d d7 because it's gone to c6 instead so anyway Portish played bishop a3 in the game so rook e8 now bishop d3 Portish again refuses to sacrifice opting to provoke a couple of weaknesses before accepting an aggressive alternative was castling queenside which is aiming for a pawn storm next a la Sicilian but such sharp positions were not Portish's forte so bishop d3 and now f5 to defend the mate threat and queen takes a8 finally Portish accepts which Fisher felt was very bad judgment noting that despite white's doubled c pawn being weak it does not spell the end of the game and better he thought instead was queen e2 where we can see another of the strengths in Fisher's move queen d7 because here he can play queen a4 adding another attacker to the c4 pawn and also attacking the loose a3 bishop white would have to play bishop b4 and black is starting to gain an edge in the position although as indicated it's far from game winning just yet and the bishops will be good compensation so queen takes a8 and now as before knight c6 traps the queen there's no escape square so queen takes e8 and the queen takes e8 and generally speaking two rooks are slightly stronger than a queen and it takes very good judgment of a position to assess whether it's the correct exchange to make so Bortish now castled and now came knight a5 attacking the c4 pawn so Bortish con continued with rook a e1 because there's no way to uh, defend the c4 pawn and it can't be pushed while the bishop is of course falling so Portish looked for counterplay against the weak e6 pawn instead and here Fisher took the pawn immediately with bishop takes c4 which certainly largens black's edge but he realized in later analysis that even stronger was queen a4 with a virtually one game already white has a few options here for example bishop b4 to defend the bishop and uh, take the queen away from attacking c4 but now bishop takes c4 bishop takes c4 and now knight takes c4 threatening knight d2 which is going to win the exchange so uh, rook takes e6 and now a5 forces bishop e7 it's the only square for the bishop now knight d2 attacking the rook rook f e1 now knight e4 with queen takes a2 coming next even if uh, white plays f3 now because from a2 the queen is also attacking the rook and black has a winning game the past a pawn here will be decisive after uh, the a2 pawn falls um, so you know that was uh, totally crushing and uh, it's a shame that uh, Fisher missed that continuation. Um, I'm just going to jump to a later game in my database. Here we go. Um, let's see now, where were we? Um, okay, yes, Bishop takes c4. Oh no, hold on now. Um, Sorry about that. Um, my uh, database is a bit muddled there. Okay, Bishop takes c4 um, is how Portish continued, and now Knight takes c4 from Fisher, which is attacking the Bishop. So uh, Bishop c1, which is the only reasonable move. But um, Black now has you know a well-posted Knight to add to his positional trump cards to use King Crusher's phrase and the question remains as to how to find the win 
from this position and Fisher has the initiative here and he took the chance to challenge the white center with c5 which is certainly the way forwards. His feeling at this moment was that there's n just no way for white to hold the end game. Portish played d takes c5. If instead d5 then uh, e5 gives black a strong kingside pawn majority and an isolated pawn here to attack on d5 so it's virtually impossible for white to hold from here. So d takes c5 and now b takes c5 and bishop f4 preventing the e5 push tactically because white can take and after the knight takes play f4 um, so you know it's a prophylax prophylactic move and it also prevents the knight from advancing to the king side because it can't move can't use these four squares um, so all in all it's a logical continuation however if we look at the position now we see that black has won that crucial pawn and more importantly he has this majority on uh, the king's side and um, that's going to lead to active play so the correct strategy from here in is to advance it which Fischer did immediately with h6 and Portish also continued logically with the rook e2 is planning to double on the e-file and attack the weak e6 pawn for counterplay and Fischer noted at this point too that if Portish had tried instead of that h4 hoping to prevent the aforementioned kingside expansion black is now able to play e5 because after bishop takes e5 knight takes e5 f4 black can play knight f3 check and the rook can't take all this rook's falling so g takes f3 is forced and from this position the white pawns are far too loose and the queen is going to have a field day rounding them up and this is a concept that is always relevant when one side is playing without a queen whether or not there are weaknesses for your, the opponent's queen to attack and if there are not then the queen generally speaking will be no better than the forces in opposition to it whether that be two rooks three minor pieces or any other combination so rook e2 now g5 attacking uh, the bishop so bishop e5 and now queen d8 so moving the queen to an open file while the chance has been made possible thanks to rook e2 and Portish again continued logically with the rook f e1 and Fisher pointed out that one of the other ideas to queen d8 was if white had played instead f4 then knight d2 is playable where best play goes rook f e1 if instead rook d1 hoping to you know pin and win the knight then knight f3 check is going to win the d1 rook so um, knight d2 rook f e1 and now knight e4 and white is totally tied up in his defense and it won't be long before black crashes through starts scooping up pawns and uh, wins easily so rook f e1 and now king f7 Fischer brings his king into the fray and gives the e6 pawn some defense and Portish continued with h3 because you know obviously he wants to attack the e6 pawn but before this move there's no square for uh, the bishop to move to and um, so obviously like the rooks can't attack the e6 pawn un until the bishop has moved um, and you know that, that's especially true thanks to Fischer's queen d8 which was nicely accurate if instead queen d7 which might have seemed better as it defends the e6 pawn white would have had bishop h8 or bishop b8 and counterplay in this position so f4 which prevents the bishop from retreating along this diagonal and uh, thus you know restricts white's counterplay which is often one of the best ways to maintain an edge if you can create one in a position and it must have been you know very annoying for Portish that his c pawn was uh, blocking his bishop from retreating so that he, he could attack the e6 pawn but Fischer seemed to be able to create and force such positions in chess with little difficulty so king h2 and now a6 which is strengthening the position before advancing which is 
also a very wise thing to do if given the time and this move ensures that any later bishop b8 will again not give white any counterplay after the advancing of the queen down the d file in order to increase the pressure on the white position which is an another of Fischer's ideas here. Portish continued with rook e4 which is attacking the knight so now the queen advances to the most aggressive and centralized square possible on the board which is queen d5 and from here the queen is certainly ruling the roost. Um, there are several threats for white to deal with here. He has to keep an eye on his a pawn. The queen is uh, eyeing it from d5. Um, but as well as that, you know, there's the idea of knight e3, which is going to break the lines of communication between the rooks and, as a result, attack the e4 rook. And if it were to move with the knight on e3, then black will have queen takes g2 which is mate so white is going to have to play very well if he wants to try and hold the position but even with perfect play it's probably impossible his move rook e4 um, didn't help matters but there was little else active to try because queen d5 was coming next in any case and if Portish had played waiting moves and hoped for a draw Fisher would have undoubtedly found a way to win one idea in particular is simply taking aim at the A pawn, winning it, and tying black down to defending the past black A pawn. Um, you know, and, and winning on the other side of the board as a direct result of that. So H4 from Portish, and this move clearly shows that he was losing hope in his position and probably disheartened about his semi blunder rook e4 as black is now winning the exchange. But Fisher noted that if instead rook 4e2, the move f3, gives white a lot of problems, his only reasonable response is to capture. If instead rook e4, then f takes g2, followed up with knight d2, is winning the exchange and the game. So f3, g takes f3, and now knight d2, threatening to win the exchange with knight takes f3 check. And in fact, it forces the win of the exchange and uh, the game. Alternatively, to rook 4e2 or h4, white had f3 in order to defend his rook, but this allows knight e3, which is very strong. I think it was Lasker who said a knight planted on the sixth rank in the center was at least as strong as a rook. As before, the a pawn is attacked here. And uh, you know white can try a4, but now comes queen a2, attacking the a pawn and threatening mate at the same time, and uh, it's, it's completely winning for uh, for black. So h4 anyway from Portish. Now came knight e3, which is winning the exchange. So rook one takes e3. White is forced to give up the exchange if he wants to play on. Playing instead f3 to defend the rook is losing to queen d2 which attacks the rook and threatens mate which again forces white to give up the exchange. I'm just going to jump back into my database for a second. Um, just have a look at this one quickly. Okay. So yeah, after um, rook 1 takes e3, you know, white is forced to give up the exchange. So f takes e3, and now rook takes e3, and thanks to queen d5, the a pawn is falling. And, uh, you know, from here, Portish's position is completely lost, and he could easily resign at this position, but he chose to play on, maybe with the hope that Fisher could uh, blunder, in some way but no such luck because here he played king e8 which is going to make sure that there's no uh, counterplay or danger of you know little mating threats or that kind of thing um, so bishop g7 which is attacking the h pawn and queen c4 which is a very nice move defends the three isolated black pawns also threatens um, queen takes h4 and check um, and allows the advancing of this a pawn which is going to be 
the decisive factor in this game now. So Portish continued h6 g5 and h6 g5 then played rook f8 check which is just a spite check really you know before uh, throwing in the towel. So king d7 and now rook a8 um, applying a bit of pressure to the isolated black a pawn. But after king c6 Portish resigned seeing that his position was totally lost. This uh, Past a pawn is going to be decisive, and there's no way to stop its advancing and uh, queening with the support of the king and the queen here. So um, at this point, Portish had had enough and resigned. So it was a fantastic game from Fisher, who uh, showed very good positional judgment in assessing that his queen would be stronger than the two rooks, and um, there was lots of very instructive little finesses there in the game. So we can have a quick um, replay with uh, the threatened squares and uh, flip the board so we can see what it's like to play against Fisher and also see the game from start to finish. Okay, here we go. So Portish is uh, probably one of the most famous Hungarian chess players of all time. He was uh, very highly respected and um, you know had several brilliant victories throughout his career and uh, it's amazing that Fischer could play against such players and uh, seemingly force them to play these dodgy lines and take these big risks he was uh, famous for doing that against many different players and um, yeah I mean you know Portish is uh, was at the time one of the best players in the world and Fischer defeats him here in around 30 moves which is nothing really approaching a miniature. It was also instructive here when uh, Fischer didn't play Queen A4 because uh, you know sometimes even uh, the best players in the world fall prey to routinely playing moves that are going to uh, just snap up material or you know the most routine and the most simple move in the position as opposed to finding the move which is the most positionally crushing and uh, obviously that's the most desirable way to do things and um, I think we we all fall prey to doing that occasionally um, so yeah it's something to bear in mind with uh, games in the future and from here as I said the uh, past A pawn here is totally decisive there's no way to stop its advancing all the way down the board here with the support of the king and as well as that the king can come to the center and uh, create threats and the bishop is tied to the friendly gear and it's just totally hopeless from for white from here in so i hope you enjoyed that please leave any comments or thoughts thanks very much